So uh, this is picking up where we left off uh, a week ago, or I guess two weeks ago now, on learning. And I wasn't sure exactly where or how I should go about this, and just figured it makes the most sense to just go at a pace that's reasonable, as opposed to rushing stuff, and there's no big hurry, I think, to get any of this done. And I'd rather sort of get some information across that's understood than just sort of get a whole bunch of information across that doesn't mean much. And even if I don't finish, at, uh, you know, whatever, um, I'll be okay with that. So this is sort of going to be uh, the end of the first half, um, at least conceptually the way that I see it in this beginning of the second half. And this, this second half is going to really be all about uh, theory crafting and integration. And that's sort of what we've been doing. The, the whole first part of is just getting the, the framework to be able to think about some of these things. Um, so my obligatory thanks. Uh, Keith Kendrick, he's r really um, very helpful. I watched some of his videos, and he just can explain some of these neuroscience concepts very well, and it really helped me to think about this stuff. And again, of course, I'm going to steal some of his ideas, but uh, hopefully put a, a little bit of a psychiatry spin on them as well. So <clears throat> I also noticed that somebody fixed my camera at some lecture. Uh, I went back and watched one of the lectures, and so I don't know who did it, but thank you. And, and again, I'm scatterbrained, so if it's like turn there and I'm up here, you can move the camera. I appreciate that. Was that you? It was Joe. Okay, well, thank Joe for me. He <laughs> saved that whole lecture. It would have just been staring at the board. Um, so <clears throat> this is going to be the introduction to a big part of the way that I go about thinking how individuals are different. And that's, you know, we're all the same in some ways and we're all different in some ways. And I think that part of this whole learning thing is really going to explain some interesting concepts of what makes us, us different as far as cultural differences and individual differences. And so it's, it's pretty useful uh, for me in that extent of things. So these next couple of lectures are probably also going to be the most difficult to comprehend because they're more abstract ideas than anything we've been talking about before. Some of it's totally made up, and I'm sort of making up jargony terms to try and help fit some of these um, ideas in. And I'm also using terms that we know, like learning, in different sorts of ways. So it can get confusing. I can just parse my terms. So if it's not making sense, and I just keep saying like words that aren't seeming to make sense, just stop me and be like, you know, can you explain some of that? And then I, I think that would be better than just keep going. Um, I'm also sending out a handout. It's going to be pretty long. I'll send it out sometime this week. Um, I don't really expect anybody to fully read it, but it's going to cover last lecture, this lecture, and at least the next lecture, and possibly two lectures. So if you think about it that way, you know, it makes more sense in a sizable chunk if you could sort of read it over the next month. Um, it, I think, will be helpful for having an alternate view of what I'm saying up here in a sort of more pre-planned, thought-out way, because I get up here and I just spew, as opposed to, you know, a little bit more coherent sometimes when I can go back and edit and, and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> all right, so this is picking up on where we left off the last time, talking about this idea of, of hubris and where are we going with this. And psychiatry is pretty paradigmatic, and we all say that, right? It's in all the textbooks, but then we turn around the next second and we use paradigms to explain this stuff. And so I think if we're going to be using paradigms, which we're going to because it's just human to explain things in a way that we can conceptualize it, we might as well attempt to create a paradigm that's integrative and inclusive. Because that way, even though we're not getting at the truth, I think we're getting closer to it. And so that's what this whole series is sort of about, is just looking at, hey, look, there's different systems, and they all fit in in some way, and hopefully we can sort of see when a certain system makes more sense to apply, but understanding that they're all happening at the same time. Um, so I, I like it because it sort of has multiple facets, and it also gives us a scaffolding to put in new information and see whether information is sort of congruent in different levels. And it allows us to sort of see what we don't know and what we don't understand in a lot of ways. And I think that that makes this paradigm more human because it's pretty human to not know and it's pretty human to not understand. And I think it's also helpful to know, you know, if we don't know something, it's better to know that we don't know it. And that sort of gets to the next point of hopefully decreasing you know, non-maleficence and helping beneficence. So if you don't know, uh, if you know that you don't know, it allows an area for you to go in and see if you can explore it more reasonably than just sort of thinking you know it with this model when it's really maybe not holding a whole bunch of water. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of ultimately be able to go back to a lot of concepts um, going way back when and 
you know, not throw everything out. Don't throw out Freud. That would be silly. So we can take the good and sort of leave out some of the bad. And I think if we stop and, and really look at it honestly, Freud holds a lot of explanatory power. And in some ways, even more honestly than, than modern psychopharmacology does. And, you know, again, it, it's going to be about using what we have. There's no reason to throw away very smart people making very, very good observations. It's just maybe helpful to sort of understand it in a more scientific way that we can universally apply it. Um, so, oh yeah, this is an important part. So if I'm ever sounding smart, um, it's because I'm a ripoff. And, and I mean that really in, in, I guess, as respectable a way as I can say it. You know, I'm just looking at all these puzzle pieces or jigsaw pieces and, you know, some giant created each of them and I'm just like a child mashing them together until it begins to make a picture that's coherent. And, and I, I think that it's just really trying to make sense of what a whole bunch of smart people have noticed, but also seeing the scope of it over time to sort of see, hey, where do these things start to fit together? And ultimately, we can, you know, instead of just taking one puzzle in its own right, if we can sort of integrate it, we can get a more clear picture. And that's going to be the goal here. Um, along the way, we're going to be reductionistic. We're going to make models that are going to be way too simple to mean anything with the goal of building and building and building and then ultimately taking away the scaffolding and getting a picture of what we're really seeing underneath. Uh, so again, integration, integration, integration. I can't really say that enough. In the first lecture, we talked about, you know, what do we do as psychiatrists? We get asked, like, the most difficult questions ever. You know, explain this human phenomena. Um, and so that's really, really complicated. And I think that we're better able to answer questions like that than we could in the past. But at the same time, a simple explanation is not going to suffice. Um, it might suffice. It might placate someone, and that might be okay uh, if, it's, if it's necessary to do. But at least when we're asking ourselves those questions, we need to understand that it's going to be a difficult, a difficult explanation. You know, if I say, how does a computer work? Zeros and ones. I mean, you know, maybe not. Not really. I mean, that's a part of it. We see zeros and ones. If I call up a computer guy and I'm like, hey, this stuff's happening with my computer, whatever, it's flickering, something. You know, if he, if he were to tell me, oh, well, look, oh, clearly you've got too many zeros and not enough ones, let's just throw some ones in there. I don't know how, how much I'm going to trust him. You know, sometimes maybe those ones go in the right place and they do something good. Sometimes maybe they do the wrong thing and make things worse. And so I guess what I'm getting at is, is similarly to a computer, you've got to sort of know what each part of that computer does, how it's integrated, how those pieces interact, what principles are guiding what happens in a system that's a computer, and then you can begin to sort of troubleshoot a computer. And I, I think that you know, the analogy there sort of makes sense. Um, and to use that same sort of model, um, you know, I'm going to be playing around with the concept of, of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You, know, you take one piece out of a computer, and it's, it's not really the same. And so, you know, again, with a model that's integrative, you know, we started this discussion a few months ago, it's going to keep going. And just because I stop talking at some point, it doesn't mean that this is piecemeal, sort of, you know, the idea is that we really want to integrate all of this stuff, because it's all happening at the same time. Sometimes a certain level is going to be where the relevance is, but it's all happening at the same time. And so, again, you take out one of those lectures, and you're, you're missing a crucial part to understanding the integration. And of course, I'm not covering everything. You know, there's not every, I'm not going to talk about every single part. We don't know every single part. But I think I'm covering some big parts, and it's allowing you the ability to understand when we see new parts, how are they going to fit in? Because we do know a whole bunch of stuff. And I think you know, we almost sometimes don't give ourselves enough credit for it. We know a lot about these systems. Uh, and, and we can begin to make some reasonable predictions about what might be happening in things. And again, here, it's sort of the idea of the whole grid and some of its parts. You take a, you know, a single gear out of a watch, and maybe stuff can turn, but it's, it's going to lose its functionality, um, likely, as a watch. So all right, I went on a long time there. Uh, the next couple things are going to come up a lot, and they've served me really well for trying to understand these, these concepts. And those are just, we learn how we think, and we think how we learn. And that's going to come up over and over again. Because part of what we're trying to figure out here is how do we learn, and not just in the cognitive sense, but in all of these sort of um, you know, other associations that we might have. And, and how do we think what, what leads our thought processes along? Um, we're going to talk about the mind web. It's uh, going to be the beginning model that we're going to grow on, a whole lot on. It's going to start sort of simple and abstract, and it's going to grow hopefully to include, include neuronal components as we go. 
We're going to talk a lot about the idea for, uh, of quality from quantity, more so probably in the next uh, talk than this one, but I'm going to bring it up as we go so you can start thinking about it. And then we're going to really start um, getting at the roots of how does this whole learning process begin um, with genetic and biologic learning, and I'll define those terms when we get there. All right, so did anybody listen to the song? I, I sent the email out. So it's not a... Everyone? Okay, fair enough. It's not, it's not necessarily whether you like it or not. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll start tell, pose the question. Tell me about it. No, I want you to tell me. Just tell me about the song. It's a good song. It's a good song. Anyone else? I'm sorry? They have accents. They have accents. It assaulted my senses. It assaulted <laughs> Dr. Hobbs's senses. Like in a death metal assault, sort of good way? or <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, I like it. I, I've just discovered that. So. Okay. How about something... So that, that's good. That's very much what I'm looking for. Tell me more. There's a lot of string instruments. There's a lot of string instruments. I will take anything. The banjo comes out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> They looked like they were enjoying themselves. Okay, so we saw this song, maybe with the video, and, and we, we took things away from it. And if you stop and think about what did we take away from it, how are we able to have this conversation, each of those individual things are ridiculously complex tasks that we've solved. I mean, each of those things that you've said, if you were to try to get a computer to answer those questions, it's not going to happen in a long, long time. It required so much sophistication, so many modules coming together, working in a, an organized way to make any of those observations that it's, it's just amazing that we can do any of this, sort of. And we'll talk about maybe why it's less amazing at second pass than at first pass. But it took a lot of learning, right? So let's say you were two years old and I played this song for you. And I asked you, two-year-old maybe could maybe begin to sort of say, you know, what do you think about the song? What sort of responses would I get? They might actually try to sing it. They might try to sing dance it, to it or dance to it. So it's going to be different. Their understanding is going to be different. Their thoughts during the song are going to be different. They're not going to be able to say anything about a banjo because they're not even aware of a banjo's unique existence in separateness from other things. So they may have heard the sound. It may have, you know, s maybe or not they could differentiate it more or less from a guitar, but they're not going to recognize it for what it is. The words that they're hearing are going to have different meanings. The, the complexity of what they're getting is going to be different. And so somewhere along the way, between being two years old and being, you know, 25 years old, we're all pretty young in here, um, we learn these things. We, our brain changed in a way, and it's constantly changing. And your brain has changed before you heard the song from now. You have traces in your brain, or I don't want to say traces, you have changes in your brain that are allowing you to recall that song in certain ways. And again, we'll talk about how that's really, really, really amazing that we can do this, and, and the level of data that's required to sort of do that. Um, so that is uh, sort of a first pass of it. Now we can imagine different things can, can be gained from that. Dr. Hobbs mentioned about they look like they were having fun. So you watch the video versus you don't watch the video. You experience different things. You, know, you listen to it while you're at the gym working out versus you listen to it while you're doing homework. You experience different things. You listen to that song, it's in the background when you have your first kiss versus it's a song that's playing when you get in a car accident. You experience different things. So none of this is occurring in a vacuum. And that is going to give this model a lot of power. Lots of things are happening in the present and lots of things are happening in the past that are changing the way that you're perceiving this in the present. And the goal of this model is to understand how those things integrate and how they happen using the neuroscience that we've learned before. And I think that's really beginning to, to become a possibility. Um, so what is the process? This is a really difficult question. But what is the process that began us to have these memories, this learning? What's the first thing that had to happen? This is, again, a sort of a guess what I'm thinking question. I don't like those. Senses. Senses. Okay, could we go a step before that? Did something happen before it hit our senses that was necessary? 
Right, the, the, the reproduction of it, the physicality of it. A wave had to be produced. Right? So, and, and this sounds like a moot point, but it's something that I think is really, really important. So it begins as a physical phenomenon. What it becomes is something completely different. But that physical phenomenon is necessary. Now again, we're gonna, clearly we can have these hear sounds without a physical thing happening on the outside, but there's still going to be a physical thing on the inside. It's going to be different. We'll cover that. But again, understanding that the physicality has to happen first. It is the physicality that is driving this ultimate perception. So you take that away and the perception goes away. Um, and that will be something that we, we sort of come into uh, later. So nobody described this, okay? Nobody described a green squiggly. This is not what we perceived. This is what began the perception. This is the wave that, that created this. So it gets back to the, the old question, if a tree falls in the woods, can anyone hear it? And I'm going to go ahead and venture an answer to that. I'm going to say no. If a tree falls in the woods, it produces a wave. It is not heard until it is perceived as sound. So a wave only becomes a sound wave once it is perceived as such. In that wave, there is nothing intrinsic inside this wave that has a sound production. It is a physicality. It is only the interaction with our neuronal system that has a consequence of sound. So that's sort of an interesting point. And it's just getting at this idea of this has its own set of properties that does not necessarily include what is we're perceiving. So it, I'm separating out sort of externality from internality is all that I'm getting at here. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is where the similarity ends. This sound wave is pretty much the same when it hits all of our ears. But what, what, parsing my words, this wave is about the sound, same when it hits all of our ears. But from then out, the sound is different. And it's different in a lot of ways. In some ways it's going to be similar, and in some ways it's going to be different. And we can already begin to see why it's different when it hits my ears versus someone else's ears, right? Our cognitions. When we hear a word, it means different things to us. When we hear a musical phrase, it, it means something's different, different to us. Our internal emotional state is going to change the way that we view the song. If Dr. Hobbs maybe was you know, with someone he cared about when he heard it and was having a great time, it might go from being a terrible song. If, you know, if they begin dancing, it might become an okay song. The perceptions of it can change. The meanings of it can change. And that's, I think, very much how we go about judging things and experiencing things. They have a lot to do with what we've learned before and what's going on in the present when we perceive it. Or, maybe not. Or, or maybe if I were 15 when I first heard it. Yes, that's even, that's even uh, a... You know how everybody likes the songs they grew up with? And, and we can talk about that a little bit why, yeah. maybe. Sure. Um, There's natural and, changes and, that may be that. And, and we can begin, and, and that's sort of where I'm, I'm getting at next, is wh why do these, and we'll, we'll get there in, in just a second, why do certain sounds mean or feel different ways to different people? And you can largely guess what kind of music kids are going to like at certain points of their life based on certain things. And that's just sort of interesting. Um, so I guess we can begin to see how different parts of this song are going to be more different than others. So the first pass of this is if somebody didn't understand English, their interpretation of the song is going to obviously be different, right? They might hear roughly the same phenomes and sounds, but what happens after that's going to be very different. Take that a step further, even individuals who speak English, when I hear, say, lion, I might think different things than you think. And that's beginning to get at this idea of we say the same words, but we speak different languages. The same thing is going to be true for the musical phrases. And again, they call them musical phrases because think of what they're getting at. These are combinations of intervals that are related in some sort of way to produce a thought. Whether that thought is more emotive or more sophisticated, that's what we're getting at. And the more vague the concept, the less overt association you have with it, the more likely the discrepancy in what we're going to associate with that sound. And that's going to be true sort of throughout. The more abstract the idea, likely, the more different each person's individual association is going to be with it. Concepts like love, for example, things that don't have very neat boxes are going to allow for more sort of personal expression of, of understanding. Um, all right, so <laughs> how come we perceive certain things? And we, we didn't talk a lot about uh, specific attention things, but 
Uh, Peter mentioned the banjo, right? How come the banjo? How come the banjo stuck out versus the drum? How come a certain lyric stuck out over another? And that's going to have to do with attention. And attention is going to be one of the biggest modules that we're going to cover. And if you think about it, it's really important. Attention is going to drive what we perceive. What we are perceiving is being decided in some neurochemical algorithmic way at every given point based on whatever prior learning and hardwiring we have. And there's some hierarchy of this. It's going to be different for different people. You know, emotionality can drive attention. Danger sense can drive attention. You know, lots of things can, and we're going to talk about that later. And we can even begin to think about, you know, what is the process that does that? I mean, we know how these neurons sort of operate. We can think of the beginnings of neurochemical ways that we can drive certain things to be more present in our conscious versus less present in our conscious. And clearly there's this spectrum between, you know, not aware of it at all, mildly aware of it, back of our heads, we're aware of it, and it's sort of crystal clear right in front of our eyes. And, you know, obviously this spectrum which can be driven by this module of attention. Um, and then there's efficiency, which is something we've gotten at before. The more integrated we have data, the more integrated we can store it, the more easier we're going to be able to recall it and the longer it's going to stick around. And that's sort of getting at this idea of, you know, nine raised, we can either remember nine raised to the nine or 387,420,489. If we have ways of, of breaking stuff down, we can remember it easier. And that's sort of like chunking, like certain people will do. So we remember a phone number, right? For, I almost gave my phone number out on the internet. <laughs> So 757-555-8920. We don't remember that as 10 discrete numbers. We, we chunk it out, and that's efficiency. We're allowing ourselves to compile data down. And certain people can do that amazingly, amazingly well, as we'll see shortly. And then there's processing power, which is getting at this heart of some people's got better supercomputers. And processing power and efficiency are going to go together to some extent. Um, and the spectrum for that is going to be ridiculously wide. And so there's this guy uh, called the Rain Man. And here I've got a nice book. It's called Henderson, the Rain King. Um, it's got a lion on it, so I figured that's a nice uh, connection. We'll take a quick view of this video. I'm not aware. Gosh, this guy's ridiculous. So we'll just watch the first minute or so. So, pretty impressive. So, this is... That's a fair question, and, and we can talk a little bit about how, where do some of these savantnesses come from, and I've asked you that a while ago and thought about it a lot, and we can actually talk about it sort of when we're done. It's not something I've, I've formally thought about, but it's super interesting to, to imagine. So what he may have is a deficit. Or, yeah, it's an interesting concept, and, and we, can, we can think about where these things come from. Uh, he may not be. In fact, he, yeah, we can get to it. It's, I'm not sure what it is. Um, but certainly when they look at his brain, there are different things there, and it's not sure what what led to those things. And similarly with Einstein, like, like Peter had sent out, again, I don't want to take up a whole bunch of time because I'm cutting it short on this lecture, but it's certainly an interesting thing to think about. Um, I bring this up only because 
when we think about efficiency and processing power, we often think about supercomputers and super geniuses and stuff like that. Um, but what this is, is the traveling salesman problem. And what the traveling salesman problem is, is what is the shortest distance to get between, you know, n number of points and end up where you started? And this is easy if you have two points, right? I mean, it's always the same thing between the two points. Three points, we can do it with low numbers. And it's pretty simple. You just draw the lines, you add them up, and you count the distances. Once you get to a certain point, it becomes just impossible to do using our standard linear thinking. There is uh, like 15, I wrote it down, <laughs> 43 billion possible solutions here, OK? Humans were not able to solve this problem forever. Only recently have we been able to solve them. And anybody want to take a guess how we solve them? Ants. Ants can solve this problem perfectly if you give them enough ants and enough time. And they do it not in an intellectual way, but in just a simple biological set of rules way. And I'm going to begin to make the argument more and more that we solve problems in a lot less of an intellectual way than you think. All intelligence, to some extent, is artificial intelligence. And let me not state that, that too concretely, but I think as we begin to see systems that are beginning to develop intelligence, we don't want to think about things in certain ways because they're difficult concepts. But certainly it holds all the same, from an outside perspective, semblances that intelligence would. And so, you know, it's very interesting how they do that. And they do it through pheromones. And this is, again, just a modeling of if it works. It is. So that's it's right. A demo it's a simple chemo gradient uh, and pheromones. Uh, to do a traveling salesman and optimize the path. Uh, as we put it in another city here, we can see uh, the change to the network. What's it doing? He's running ants. So you can see it's sort of figuring it out based on. It's a, it's a different kind of computer model here. So that's a, a demo of using. What it's sort of looking at is that ants simply have a few rules, and it's sort of like the bees that we talked about before. And based upon these like pretty much two simple rules about gathering food and leaving pheromone trails and randomness, you can produce more and more perfect solutions to the problem. Because more of them are going to sort of follow these rules to make the shortest path. And so over time, the other pheromone trails will thin out until they're all ultimately walking the same trail. So it begins random, and it, and it starts to model this over time. And they can solve it amazingly accurately. And we can you know, talk about later about different sort of solutions. I just wanted to bring that up now so we can start thinking about this idea of really all that we're really looking at is problem solving in systems. And some of these systems are simple, and some of these systems are more complex. But ultimately, intelligence is problem solving to some extent. Um, and, and brings up the next idea of a Rubik's Cube. And I bought, brought cubes, but we don't have a lot of time to play with them. We'll play with them probably in the next lecture. And solving a Rubik's Cube is easy, right, if you can take out one thing or another. If you take out time, it's super easy. Just turn it, right? There's only 43 quint quintillion possibilities, OK? So if you make one turn per second, it'll only take you a million millennia to solve it, right? But if you get rid of the variable of time, if time is not of the essence, you will solve that problem. If you just add one or two simple rules, you can solve a cube amazingly quickly. There's not a lot of rules that you need to know that a computer needs to know to solve a cube. You can, and again, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but it's one of the simplest things to write a program to solve a Rubik's Cube. You can do it in your first year of computer programming because it doesn't take a lot of different uh, steps if you can memorize them and find ways to get to those steps to solve a cube. And there are many other ways to solve a Rubik's Cube simply by uh, using it in a more cognitive way of, of, of constructing layers, which is how most people solve a cube, is sort of building it in layers and understanding certain manipulations. You can imagine if you had a perfect visual spatial understanding of connectedness between each part, it wouldn't be an issue at all. You would just look at the cube, see how it all fits together, and you'd solve it instantly. Another way that you can solve it is just to memorize every single possible pattern. Although that's not what people do, because that would be 43 quintillion. What they do is you can break that number down very quickly uh, if you just get rid of a few steps. So they memorize 
a few thousand of these possibilities and the way that they interconnect. And they can quickly get to one of those possibilities and then solve it in the fastest way possible. And when you see these people solving the cubes and you know, ridiculous amounts of time, 12 seconds, 15 seconds, that's what they're doing. They're, at that point, not even using intelligence to some extent. They're doing what a computer would be doing, although it sort of got there using intelligence. And so the real world is, is not as simple as a cube. There's a lot more going on. But we're going to see how problem solving in one sphere can often be applied to problem solving in another sphere. And once you make those spheres big enough, you've got something that looks like a mini world. You can grow that out, and you can start to see that it's not impossible, and I'll make some other arguments, to create over time something that very much resembles real intelligence. And, and I really see very little way that we don't get there. Um, and so while I'm talking about quality from quantity, because that's sort of what this idea is, is sort of small steps leading to bigger steps in emergent phenomena, I've got to talk about Garry Kasparov. And so he's like this quick story, chess grandmaster, plays Deep Blue, this IBM supercomputer. Mr. Blue is crushing him. And he says something along the lines of, this computer has achieved quality from quantity. It is as F, it knows the game perfectly and is playing intelligently. And then he then goes on to say, it is as if I cannot beat it because it does not fear the feint in my move. And it is not anxious about the outcome of this game. And I don't know if he realized this or not, but he was actually redeeming himself in those statements. Because while anxiety that's too great or fear that's too great can hamper you at chess playing, we were not built for chess playing. And so it is those things that make us less good at chess that allow us to do lots of other things. And so what we're starting to see is compromises. We have to operate in a lot of different environments than just chess. So we are not optimized for chess. We are optimized, whatever, but we won't go there right now. But the idea is that we have lots of different abilities that we can adapt to certain things, but that's not what we were designed for. And so that's just sort of getting a little bit about the idea, idea of quality from quantity. Deep Blue achieved intelligent quality just from the quantitative ability of it to crunch numbers. All right, so this is going to bring us to our first concept, uh, the mind web. And we're going to grow it a lot. It's going to start really, really simplistic, and we're not going to get very far uh, today. But I think you'll begin to start liking it, I hope. I mean, it's just going to operate on this principle of we learn how we think, we think how we learn. Um, and it's going to start with these ideas of symbols. And I'm going to talk a whole bunch about symbols over the next couple of talks. And we can just think about symbols in a most superficial way as sort of an internal representation of things, a perception of things, with all of the associations to it. Cognitive associations, emotional associations, sensory associations, sort of everything. All right, so we're going to go to the board, and we're going to start with lion. And we're going to be talking about lions a whole bunch. Okay, so when we want to make a mind web, this is what we do. We take our concept, we put a circle around it, and then we think about things lion. Okay? With a K, we draw a line. All right, we draw a line. All right, now these things can start having their own things attached to them, and they can explode out you know, to infinity to all of our associations, and there's going to be stuff everywhere. So that's you know, just the idea of what we're going to do with it, and I've got some pre-constructed ones here. So how about not telling the truth? So that's, that's an awesome one. Um, and we can see we have some more abstract ones in here, like four-letter word, and somewhere I wrote rhymes with Ryan. We can do lots of those things, and, and we'll, this is what's going to make these things interesting um, as far as context, right? Because we can hear the same sound and understand it based on the context, and that's actually fascinating that we can do that. And I think we can use this mind web to understand why we do that. So again, this is ridiculous. This is not what a lion is. Okay? This is our first pass understanding of just simply initial cognitive things that came up in my mind. I did not spend a lot of time doing this. I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing this. And I think that there's a practicality to just sort of rushing through it. So again, this is going to grow ridiculously quickly. 
It's not going to be centered on Lion. And we can imagine this will grow with our experiences, right? Because now we can put Henderson, the Rain King here, because we saw that thing, and then Counting Crows wrote the Rain King, and you know, all these things are going everywhere. So, oh, now here is, is the first point where we're going to start talking about how we think. So I'm going to tell you the order in which I came up with these things, because I was writing them down as I was coming up with them. So Maine, Africa, Pride, King, Simba, Claws, Teeth, Roar, Muscle, Four-Letter Word, and Rhymes with Ryan. So now I'm going to make the argument that this is not random. It was not random at all how I came up with those things. So Africa and then pride, as in African pride. Pride and then king, and we can imagine. And this is really interesting, actually. I wrote a note in here, because uh, then I had to draw an extra line. But I wrote, I have to draw an extra lion, which is perfectly getting at this idea of what we're thinking before is going to lead to what we're thinking next. And we're going to get to neuronally how that happens next time. So you, we can imagine that pride is also connected to king, and that's sort of what's driving this. We can begin to imagine maybe there's neural underpinnings to this, and we'll, we'll, we'll come up with some models later. King to Simba, maybe through Lion King. Then sort of gotten to claws, teeth, and roar. You know, claws and teeth sort of parts. Teeth is in the mouth. Roar comes from the mouth. Roar and muscle, sort of roar being associated with strength. And then realizing I could think outside of the box. Four-letter word and rhymes with Ryan. There are relations to these things. This is not random. So, you know, you can say, you know, oh, well, this is just post hoc analysis. But I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. It's not. I think that there's way too much significance to that for it just to be post hoc analysis. And you could design, you know, I could guess uh, that there would be certain probabilities more than chance into a study. And my guess is that um, with or without the study, it's going to be true. Um, and this is just getting at the idea of we learn how we think and we think how we learn. So this brings us to the next idea. Has anyone here played the game Taboo? I think so. Okay. So Taboo is a game where you get a card and you're not allowed to say certain words. And you have to say words to get someone on your team to guess what that word is. So we're going to play that game a little bit because it's really fascinating. So it's amazing how efficient we are at doing this if you actually stop and think about it. So the reason that taboo is fun is that it's not what's in your mind. It's about what's in their mind. And this is getting at the idea of mentalization. So if I've got a word that say lion, and I say something that makes me think of lion, you might say something ridiculous, and that's funny, right? Because no, I'm thinking lion, and you just said something insane. Like, uh, who's a famous liar? I don't know, Peter Oliver. Like, so, it, it, you know, I'm trying to think of lion, and he says Peter Oliver, who might be a lion in certain settings, as I've heard, but, but you know, it's, it's just sort of interesting how these things can, can go. And Taboo being a game about mentalization and other people's mind webs. Um, all right, so who wants to be the person who picks the word? All right, you can be the person who picks the word. I'm just going to write stuff on the board so I get out easy. Well, actually, you can just pick it in your head, okay? Oh, and pick a word, pick a, pick a word or a concept. <laughs> it can be whatever you want it to be. Pick, pick a word. Well, we can make him write them down if we don't trust him. I think we can trust him. But you can pick a word or a concept, whatever you'd like it to be. And once you've got it, just let me know, and I'll sort of let you know what we're going to do from there. Okay. So, so that's, that's okay. Before you um, go, what I want you to do is just tell me one word that you can imagine, whether it's very close to this concept and we get it easy or it's far from this concept, just say one word and then give us a chance to give responses. And I'm going to sort of document what's happening and maybe how we're thinking based on this mind web model. Um, so just start with a word. Dog. All right. So that's our first cue. Let's see what sort of responses we get from that. Any more? All right, that's good enough. And also, let us know if you think you know the answer and with how much confidence. Do you, any of you think you know the answer? Maybe some confidence, probably pretty low. All right, well, how about the next? how sadistic I'm being, too, because I can make this really easy well, or really hard. That, uh, that's right. That's fair. And that, okay. in putting in more variables, let's keep going with it. And I think yeah. quickly you'll see how we can collapse on a, an extreme amount of confidence, depending on what the concept yeah. is. Band. 
Am I allowed to play? <laughs> what do you all think? No. <laughs> I can, I can, can I, I'll start making Led Zeppelin. Or, uh... It's as if we're playing a game of taboo. Um, Three Dog Night or something like that. I don't even know the name of that thing. Boskags. <laughs> Is that the next one? Well, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I, I still don't have a high level of confidence. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of what what band wrote the song Africa. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> dun. <laughs> Boy, we're not doing very well at this. <laughs> Generally, the idea of taboo is to make it easy. Yeah. Right. Who do you want us to guess? Okay. So that we get a point. Right. Yeah. Pause. The okay. Wizard of Oz. Wizard. Okay. There we go. Wow, that was uh, good. Yeah. They're right. They're, they're in South Africa. Yeah. That's right. I knew it was getting there. I just couldn't think of the name of the band. That was terrific. Oh, and Oz is the name of a band. No. No, no, no. The, Wizard of Oz. the Wizard of Oz. The band is called Toto. The band is called Toto. Oh, I, I knew the song. And, Toto. and, and yeah. think about how amazing oh, God. we could imagine. We can imagine what each of our individual mind webs look like. So I, I didn't even use that part since I had no clue. The, that's right. right. I just right. used Oz and dog. And if, I, that, if, I, if my first word instead of had been dog and my second word had been Oz, yeah, the game would have been over immediately. And, and that right. gets at the point of these mind webs are not based on factuality. They're not based on what... All that it's based on is our individual learning. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. All that it matters is that we've learned it and we have that association. So it might take you down the wrong road for knowing it, and it might take me down the right road for not knowing it. And so this is not implying you know, anything like that, but it's interesting to start thinking about those things and sort of seeing what, what this might lead to. So again, I'm going to say this is not what a lion is. What's a lion? We'll start here. What's a lion? All right, that that's, might be the best response. What's a lion? Uh, a mammal. A mammal. What's a lion? A hairy mammal. I want you to purify what is a lion. Convince me. What's a lion? Well, you mean something that would be a, a definitive description of a lion, and nothing King but a lion would match. There'd be no. We're starting to we're starting to think about it. I want you to take one more quantum leap. You're getting at the idea of convergence that we're going to get on. What is a lion, what, getting at the idea of what a lion is and what a lion isn't. And there can be cognitive ideas that get there, but what is a lion? If you want to explain a lion to a Martian, how are you going to do it? Show a video. Show a video, right? And that's getting at this next idea. Why, when I ask you what's a lion, it's like, it's a lion, stupid, right? We see it. We know it. It's crystal clear. It is not here. It is in that sensory data that we have, which I'm going to argue is different than how we store this data. So, you know, the best that you can do is say stuff like a hairy mammal and assume that I know what a hairy mammal looks like. But imagine if you could just use words without sensory data. At some point, you're running up against a wall. And so I'm going to argue that these things are coming from sensory data and give a neuronal representation of that as well, but we'll get there. So we can modify our mind web, okay, and we're going to continue doing this. And again, we're still not in a vacuum, but this is looking as if we're in a vacuum. This is just sort of looking at a, a conceptualization of what's a lion. We've taken the same concept and we've added sensory data, right? We've got a picture of a lion. We've got many pictures of a lion. We've got an emotional tone to it, whatever it might be. There can be multiple components to that. We've got spatial data, where we've seen lions, where they exist, that zoo, where they were in the cage. We've got sound waves of a lion roaring. 
That is what is composing the essence of what a lion is. If I want to know what a lion is or isn't, this is what I want, right? So, you know, they say what we want to get at is what a lion is and what a lion isn't. And that's ultimately happening primarily in this sensory data. And it goes back to this old idea that, again, neuroscience is bringing up again and again these old sort of concepts, a picture is worth a thousand words. But I'm sort of going to get at it's not. It's priceless in the sense that it can't be bought with words. Or if it is, it's going to be millions or billions of words in, in the sense of sort of digital data. Um, but it, it is a whole other currency altogether, and all of our construction is going to require both of them. We need all of these things. We, we, to be able to, to function, to be adaptable, we need to be able to use all of these sorts of things. And so we're getting closer, but it's still not happening in a vacuum. And this is not going to still predict thought. But you can imagine that this picture, well, let's just keep going. All right. So what is this? It's a picture. Okay. And we can even go further back if we want to be. And I'm just being a stickler here. But it could be different things to different people. It could be nature. It could be strength. It could be classic photography. It could be, you know, a, a exhibition in browns and greens. It, it could be... It could be a lion. Okay, it's a picture of a lion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it's still that. So A equals A, we're going to get to A equals A, which is pretty much the only thing we can count on. Um, maybe it represents the Serengeti. And I'm bringing up Serengeti for a reason. It's not a word we use a lot. It's a cool word. And it's going to get to this idea of loyalty to neurons, and we're going to talk about that later when we talk about Pamela Anderson and uh, Jennifer Aniston neurons. And... There's this data, and people get wowed about it. But when you stop and think about it, it makes sense. And you can actually be more predictive than people are now. I am willing to bet you that a Serengeti neuron is going to be an extremely loyal neuron, simply based on the mind web. Now, if you happen to work in the Serengeti, and you're associated with everything of it, Serengeti is going to be a less loyal neuron. Because if we think about it, there has to be the physicality first. This perception is coming from a physical interaction of neurons. And the more further out the concept is, ultimately, the less connections it's having, the less of a representation it's going to get tied into to other concepts. And when we get to neuronal sort of understandings of constructions of these things, I think that will become very obvious. And I think that if I get to know an individual, I can tell you what are likely going to be loyal neurons. Not from just picking the neuron, but once you've shown me the stimuli, what pops up, I can tell you that one's going to be more picky than that one. Because there's organization, and of course there is. There has to be, and it, and it makes sense how it's organized. And I don't even know how much of these studies... Is there a question? Yes, what you mean by a loyal neuron. Good, perfect. So when I say loyal neuron, I mean it lights up to Serengeti consistency, consistently, but not to not Serengeti consistently. This neuron is only flashing when we show things Serengeti, is never flashing when we show things not Serengeti. Lion, for example, is going to flash when we show, say, a picture of a pride, right? Because it's directly, maybe for me, maybe for you, no. But what I'm getting at is we have lots of things tying into lion. These, that Serengeti neuron, if I take it out of your brain and I put it here and I stimulate it, it's nothing. Okay, it is only what it is in this consortium of environment of neurons. But inside that thing, its representation is less widely mapped. And these are going to be the concepts that are going to be more vulnerable to loss based on processes. So in, in degenerative many memory conditions, we can guess based on what we know about the processes, but also best based on what we know about a person's mind web, what information they're going to lose. And it allows us to start thinking about these things in interesting sorts of way. Um, all right, so I'm going to got, uh, is it okay if I go about 10 minutes over, or do you want me to rush through this? Okay. <laughs> so this is getting at the idea of con convergence. All right, so I'm just going to give you a, another example, and I want you to tell me when you're sure you know what I'm doing. Logitech. Okay. So, keyboard, how confident were you of keyboard? Pretty confident. Pretty confident. What else could it have been? Could have been piano, right? What about Logitech? How confident are you at that point? I mean, damn confident. Of all the billions of trillions of concepts that are possible, look how amazingly we can distill a piece of visual sensory data and a single word to break it down 
instantly. I mean, it's instantaneous. And we can talk about how we know we know, how we know how much we know, and I'm going to argue that there's an emotionalness to it. There's that aha moment, which is emotional. And we learn how to judge our environment based on emotions to a large extent, and we'll talk about reuse of modules for different, different purposes later. But that's amazing to me, the idea that we can converge on a piece of information almost perfectly. I mean, there is nowhere else in the mind web where those two things converge. And we know that. And we have 100 billion neurons, and you instantly know that. That is amazing to me. It just blows my mind. So, all right, and then this is just getting at the idea of convergence, that we have this multidimensional thought space, and that we know when we've converged on a single value. You know, you've got a plane or whatever. That's just a, a general. Uh, all right. So the introduction is done. We're gonna, about to get into um, a couple of tricky concepts here. So does anybody know who this is? All right. Perfect. So I'm glad you all knew who it was. Do you have any idea of maybe why I made it easier for you? I primed you a little bit, right? I said tricky concepts. It's tricky to, so again, well, I'm going to go ahead and just wrap it all out for you. So they sing this song called It's Tricky. It goes, it's tricky to rock a rhyme to rock a rhyme. That's right, on time is tricky. And so I'm not going to rap again during this talk. And I did that for a reason and sort of we'll get back to it later and sort of just be interesting. All right. So we're going to start getting into a quick concept before we wrap up. Um, and it's going to be talking about different kinds of learning. Genetic learning, biologic learning, and associative learning. And it's just going to be a brief overview of them, and then we'll wrap up. These are difficult concepts. They're not easy to digest, and so that's sort of a, a caveat. So I'm going to go over them just very briefly, and then I'm probably going to retouch on them next time since we don't have a lot of time. But genetic learning is the basics of what makes human babies more alike to human babies than, human, than chameleon babies. So this is the, the drive behind what is making us who we are. It's what's saying, you know, the hip bone's connected to the knee bone, but it's also saying this part of the brain's connected to this part of the brain, this part of the brain's connected here, this sensor comes to here in our brain, and that creates reflex arcs. So we are not born a blank slate. We're born with reflex arcs, behaviors that we can do, and it is from this original construction of behaviors that we're going to grow our behavior repertoire. It is only going to be from the combinations of these things from which we are going to get everything that we know. Um, and there are a lot of things that we know instinctually. Breathing. We don't have to be taught to breathe. That's a fairly complicated thing to be doing. Fighting. There are certain things that we know about fighting that we never need to be taught. We can understand proprioceptive information and know how to reflexively respond to sort of help ourselves without ever having to learn that. Sex. We understand certain action patterns that are helpful in sex. And again, humans are able to expand our, our behavioral repertoire way beyond what we're born with in each of these three categories. And if we think about us, we can greatly expand our repertoire behind, beyond what we're born with. Insects, not so much. Genetically, every single thing that they can do is genetically hardwired in them from a biological standpoint. And that is amazing. Reflex arcs in different situations teaches them when to fly, where to go, where to land, etc. That's impressive. Plants, probably 100%. Everything that they do is simply a consequence of this genetic and biologic development. And getting at this idea of quality from quantity, it's yes, it's the genes that make us similar to each other, but it's also going to be the starting point of what makes us different. So we've got the same genes, the same proteins, the same number of eyes, the same number of hearts, but within them, the proteins are slightly different, the way that they respond is slightly different, and that difference is going to lead to a huge differential expression of behavior, emotions, etc. as we allow this learning process to go on. Biologic learning is getting at this idea that certain times in our lives we can change the way that we biologically respond to a situation forever. And that's getting at the idea of Michael Meany's rats. It's getting at the idea of, you know, we change the way that we handle a glucose load um, for our whole lives based on a certain set point. And so again, none of this stuff is deterministic. I, uh, all that we're doing, these are complicated systems. Stress is a complicated system. We are just changing one variable in that stress system or one relation, quantitative or qualitative, forever. 
We can still manipulate the system, but the inner relation between them has been changed forever. We have learned something in a biologic sense. That biologic learning of stress is going to play into that environment that we're in that's not a vacuum in this associative learning process. And so again, we're beginning to see the building blocks from which we can take what our environment is, what we're initially getting, and allow it to grow. And I'll go over this in more detail at the beginning of the next lecture. The associative property, I'm sorry, associative learning is going to be this whole process that we're talking about. And this is going to be how we are going to individuate ourselves. What makes me different from all of you different from everyone else? This learning process of association. What we see together, what we feel together, all of these things can get associated. We're going to talk about how we can grow our concepts from simple sort of uh, feelings, emotions, thoughts to more complicated emotions sort of thoughts um, using a couple of simple properties. And the more I do it and play with it, the more I begin to see that this really looks like what's happening to some extent in reality. Look at childhood development, look at adult development, look at what's underlying it. This is what is largely getting driven through it. Um, and of course, still using all of our previous neurochemical algorithms. We're never getting rid of any of this stuff. Um, we're still using the properties of LTP, neurons, genetics, physics, all beneath it. It's all driving it. It's all going on at the same time. This is just the level above. All right, so this is uh, wrapping up the, the talk. Who's that? Yes, thank you. So I heard some smirks. I heard some laughs. From showing you that, I have taught you all something. You have learned something, and you've learned a lot of things. There's an emotional tone to it. I rapped. I made a goofy fool of myself. You're more likely to remember these associations because of those things, and that's getting into attention. It's allowing us to begin to see this isn't random. This isn't senseless. Something real is happening here that we can begin to understand, not just on a sort of observing way, but on a deeper neurochemical way. And so think about that. You all changed. You didn't have to swallow a pill for me to chemically alter you. These neurons changed. Proteins changed. Chemicals changed. The environment influences us, and we influence the environment. And not going to go off on a spiritual or philosophical rant, but you can sort of see how we can change things without sort of our old understanding of, of, you know, you've got to give a pill for stuff. And the reason I mention that is that should be obvious, but a few years ago, over the, the last few years with fMRI, we've done studies of fMRI looking at depression and CBT. And we get these results that show, look, CBT changes the brain in a way that looks helpful for depression. And, and so now all of a sudden you believe it. Like, now you've got this double blind... Of course it does. Like, are you kidding me? It, look, of course it's changing the brain. Of course it's doing this in a way that helps for depression. We didn't need a double blind study to show that. And that's just getting at my tirade of, uh, we, you know, the tyranny of the, I said tirade, interesting. You know, we can start to think about these things. Of, of the randomized double blind placebo control trial. We don't need those things to be able to, to be confident in some of the things that we say. If we're, hesit uh, if we're cautious. So, a quick teaser for what lives have had. We've got some more chaos to deal with. We've got some silver screen analogies. We got me pretending like I'm cultured. Uh, we got some scribble knots. We got more scribble knots. We've got uh, squigglies and sensory memory. We've got more squigglies, and we're going to call on Dr. Hobbs for this one later Sorry, in the storage. Us here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We've got Raphael. We've got uh, sheep faces and speciesism. We have video game faces and racism. We've got Pamela Anderson and uh, Jennifer Aniston and God. Okay. So this is where we're going. And this is the midpoint of the lecture series. And I think we've covered a lot of good ground at this point, sort of from a basic understanding um, viewpoint. And so where are we going from here? We want to be able to sort of see how this neuroscience, this primitive hardwiring, and this associative learning can take us from not to awesome as far as understanding how is an individual shaped. Can we come up with some integrative model that lets us see what's going on with these things? We're going to cover thought construction. 
We're going to cover the thought process. We're going to cover how we can go from simple sensory information to more complex thoughts, and from more complex thoughts to even more complex thoughts. We're going to talk a lot about quality from quantity. We're going to talk about sentience, and we're going to talk a whole bunch about modules. And so, you know, we're all shrinks, right? So at the end of the day, what's the point? You know, what's the point of this? The point is that we want to develop an integrated model for being able to understand thoughts, emotions, and behaviors in sickness and health. And I think that, you know, we've mentioned this before, this is a system that we can begin to understand. What we're presenting is an integrative model that's hopefully going to allow us to reimagine all of the concepts that we know, from Freud to Piaget to CBT to individual differences to cultural differences to psychopharmacology in a more scientific but also more human way with the goal of being able to rationally understand these systems and to help people and to ultimately relieve suffering. Um, so I thank you all for uh, hearing me out and I'll take any questions.